Hi lads, it's Mr. Roderick here from a greenhouse. I'm um, just checking in and telling you a little bit about what's going on in here. Give you an idea of what you might be up to over the coming week. Um, now you can see I've got a variety of different trays and bits and pieces going on in here at the moment. Um, <clears throat> and in this greenhouse I've got mostly things that are going to end up being planted out in my garden. Uh, you can see that if you have a look closely at the labels there, I've labelled with the dates so I know when these things were planted, or when they were sown rather. Uh, and the idea behind that then is that I know roughly what's going on, what they, sort of stage they should be looking at, what sort of size they should be, depending on when they were sown. Okay. And you'll notice, for example, if I take this Cabbage Primo here, I sowed that on the 7th of April, that is now as I'm recording this a week ago. And you can see they've started to germinate, got some tiny little plants there, they're perhaps no more than about half a centimetre tall. Um, but they're going to grow into cabbages eventually, okay? And then if you look over here, the Cabbage Primo that I did, same variety, but seed sown about two weeks before, different size there, okay? And obviously the reason for that is so that I then know if there's a problem, uh, I can figure out, you know, well, perhaps I need to chuck these seeds away, maybe I need to start again. And it's easy to spot the problems then if I know when they were sown. If I haven't bothered to put the date on there, and this was the size that they were after two weeks, I mightn't realise that there was a problem, and I might just con continue with those, a wasted space in the greenhouse. Um, so to give you an idea of what we've got going on in here, we've got spinach, really good crop for you guys out there. Uh, it's a great one because it grows really well, it's really reliable, uh, and really quick to grow. And in fact, you can start harvesting that in a few weeks now. It's only two weeks old, but in about three or four weeks' time, I'll be able to start harvesting from that, and I should then be able to continue to harvest that throughout the summertime. Got some different types of lettuce. This one, Marvel of Four Seasons, another great one. Uh, it's a good cut and come again variety, so I can cut that down and that will grow back again. And I can keep cutting that three or four times through the summer and it will keep coming back. Okay. And then I've got alongside that some cos lettuce, which you guys would be more familiar with perhaps. Those big romaine hearts that you can buy in the supermarkets. And you can see these are quite small still at the moment, but these are the ones that I'm going to cut the whole head down and I'm going to eat that when it's ready. Okay. And that'll take a bit longer to get to that point as a consequence. I've also then got some cabbages, the primo that I pointed out there, that's like a white cabbage that you might use for making coleslaw or something like that. Okay, uh, and that's going to come along and I've got this other, other cabbage variety here called Greyhound. Another really good one because it grows really quickly and at this time, well, it's getting a bit easier now to get hold of a few things if you can get delivery slots and things. But if you're looking to try and grow something that you're going to be able to feed yourself with this year, it's a great, great variety if you can get your hands on the seeds. And then finally over here, I've got my Oregon sugar snap peas and for those of you that did horticulture with me last summer uh, you guys Toby and Caleb and Emmanuel and who have I forgotten there Charlie and Alfie you guys that were involved out there with us and Billy as well we really enjoyed having these sugar snap peas because they eat really well just fresh straight from the plant okay you can cook them of course you can but they come out a bit like a, a big fat monge too with little peas inside really really tasty and you can see the different sort of pots that I'm using here lots of different types of trays most of them have been recycled Okay, but I've also got over here look, an old tatty old window box. I filled it up with some compost and I put a cut again, come and game variety in there called uh, salad bowl. Okay, and that's one that you just again you cut it down when you want to eat some and you let it grow back again and you keep doing that until it starts to look a bit stringy and it's not so good. Uh, so that's just some ideas of what you can do, what your greenhouse might look like if you're working with a greenhouse. Uh, one other thing to say though, there's lots of different ways you can make a greenhouse. It might be that you decide, I know, I'm going to get one of those under bed storage tubs tip it upside down on the ground in the garden, just so that it's clear plastic, just over top of some of these trays. That will do the job. All you're trying to do is just raise the temperature inside by two or three degrees. What you'd have to watch with that is a bit of ventilation. So if it's a hot sunny day like we have had a few lately, you might want to just turn it over during the, the heat of the day, sort of midday to late afternoon, and then cover it back over night time. Okay? But you could do the same thing with a bit of clear plastic. I've got some bits of um, <clears throat> clear plastic line around here but you could do it with I don't know an old plastic bag as long as it's clear and it will let the light through that will do the job it's just trying to raise that temperature just a couple of degrees and that will help this type of crop these ones that don't mind a bit of cold it will just help them grow a tiny bit quicker wouldn't recommend it for things like your tomatoes uh, they still want to be kept inside but things like your lettuces and that they'll do all right outside actually at this time of year but if you want to try and speed them along a bit like I am by putting them in the greenhouse then there's just some ways you might want to try and do it anyway I hope you guys are taking care out there looking after yourselves and keeping busy I know lots of you are because I've heard from a few of you um, but keep in touch and we'll uh, we'll hopefully see you in the not too distant future all right take care bye-bye okay lads um so I'm back here I just remembered I was talking a little bit earlier on about uh, the greenhouse it occurred to me that not everyone's got a greenhouse at home so 
talk about ways in which you could kind of make use of what you've got at home to make a little space to grow some things under. It's really important to say that most things actually this time of year don't need a greenhouse. You get by without one, no problem at all. Um, you would need to keep things that are warm weather crops like tomatoes, beans, courgettes, that sort of thing, sweet corn. If you're sowing any of those things already, you're probably a little bit on the early side really for most of you to be doing that. But if you've got those, they want to be kept inside in the warm overnight especially. Get them outside on a warm sunny day like it's been today. Um, but night time definitely want to be inside. Other stuff like lettuce and that can go outside no problem from now on. Brilliant. And while it's been warm like it has been no problem at all. But if you wanted to try and bring things on a bit quicker, I've just brought out a little tray here of spinach. Okay. It's one of my little trays of spinach I showed in the other video earlier on. Just wanted to show you how you can just use some stuff you've got laying around in your garden to make something that's going to just help them a little bit. And in particular overnight. So I've got a bit of old plastic here. I think this came from a roof or something. I'm a bit of a womble my wife will tell you if you don't know what womble is by the way ask your grandparents or your parents they'll tell you I like to try and make things keep things hanging around and occasionally they come useful but you could do something just simple like that with a piece of plastic like that something to weight it down stop the, the wind from blowing it away keep that under there under overnight and that'll be just fine I wouldn't recommend leaving it outside like this under cover in the daytime especially not in full sunlight it'll get too hot but certainly for just covering it over at night time brilliant way of doing it if you've got something like that um, more likely to have maybe one of these old plastic underbed storage containers, something like that. Again, similar idea. Stick that down on top of there, you get a couple of trays under there, no problem at all. Just gives them a little bit of extra help overnight, keep it a bit warmer. Okay. Or you could do it perhaps with the other part of the underneath underbed storage. And with this one in particular, I'd be really careful. This is going to get really hot in here. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to see anybody just putting it flat on the ground like that. It's going to actually roast in there. You definitely want the air ventilation getting underneath. But if you did something like that, again, that's going to keep the, the cold air off the top of it. That's going to give it a little bit of help, okay? So that could work. If you haven't got any of those things, you've just got a bit of old plastic bag here, look. And again, this could be made to work, you know, like... Get a little pair of scissors. I feel like the old blue pizza in now, except I didn't bother to make this one earlier. Here we go. So... Just give that a little cut. Flatten it out. Now, more likely to move around in the wind so it's going to need a bit more weighting down maybe i've got a couple of bits of old slab here that'll do that job look at that that's not going anywhere and again that's going to do that job just giving it a little bit of extra help overnight and like i say they don't need it if you've got it and you can do it it's just a little something to do it's great it does help them along a little bit they certainly will go cr grow quicker and if you're in a hurry to get your crops great idea if you're not so bothered spinach just like this can go outside just like that on the side will be fine wants to be a bit of sunshine in the daytime but be aware the pigeons might like it and they might well eat it for you so just be careful with that anyway just a few ideas of some things you can do perhaps if you've got a few of these bits laying around you got them. have fun with it guys cheers Hi lads, hope that's recording there. It's Mr. Rove here on Mr. Rove TV. Today we're going to talk about printmaking, uh, something which you guys could start to do at home or even if you are in school, you could start to do some real simple printmaking because um, I just think it's a bit of fun, it's a bit different from drawing. So I'm going to talk about some different kinds of prints and the first one I'm going to talk about is stenciling, something which I know a lot of you have done with me before. And picking up on those guys who are doing the stuff um, on logos, maybe using their initials, in their name we could talk about how easy it is to do something which we can print and repeat using a stencil now obviously you may be uh, limited in what kind of materials you've got at home so the, the stencils I'm making today I'm literally making on printer paper you could use newspaper if that's all you had you could use any kind of paper really I've kept this design really bold and then I'm gonna cut that out obviously leaving uh, these parts are going to, bits are going to be taken away yeah now for that i would use one of these kind of craft knives but if you're really careful and it's all you've got you can use scissors if that's all you've got then that's what you've got to go for all right and you know i'm just going to i would just use this knife now to cut out this design but because i'm trying to keep this video nice and short uh, i have got one i've done here earlier and you can see it is literally just a piece of paper now with regards to paints uh, or inks as we say when we are printing yeah if you've got these if you've got uh, water relief uh, water based relief inks absolutely brilliant yeah how many of you are going to have those I don't know so looking through my cupboards um, I've got some cheap old poster paint that'll do it that'll be absolutely fine 
Uh, I've got tubes of paint like this. You know, uh, this is just any old art paint. You might have some of that. If you haven't got any of that, get down the garage or the shed and see if you've got any paint in there. Because um, all of these things will do exactly what we want them to do. Um, and similarly, yeah, nice if you've got a roller to do uh, print making. But if you haven't got those things, don't worry about it. You've just got to use what you've got. So one of the things I've done here, just to show you that you could, is got um, a sponge like that, you know, for the washing up. And literally cut that into little sections. And that's more than adequate for what we're going to do. I think what we have to remember when we're doing printing is that we don't want to put too much on at once and that's the real secret of this. So I'm going to see if I can just get through this nice and quickly to show you. Um, so I'm using some green, uh, some of the green poster paint and I've just put it into a saucer here and, and I'm going to use one of the sponges to show you if it will come out. Okay. So yeah, it's something that which isn't too, too hard to do. Again though, what we're saying is I think you should try to not use too much paint in one go. I think if you try and put loads on, I think that's when it might start to get a bit blurry and stuff. So holding the paper down or the stencil, I'm looking at going in the top like this um, and making sure it doesn't move, not going too quick. Yeah. Now this is a paper stencil, so it might not last as long as a cardboard one. If you made yours out of cardboard, I expect it would last a lot longer. But it's very simple and very easy to get a repeat pattern. Like that, let's see if we can do one more with this real thin stuff. Like I say, if you had a bit of cardboard, um, you could probably do um, you know, a few more repeat patterns. I reckon I could probably get about five or six out of this before the paper would start to tear maybe, okay? But a really effective way of doing a nice quick uh, logo. Now, you could make cards for people using this. I know some of you have done this with me at Christmas time, but you could do little flowers, you could do uh, little figures, you could do your name, you could do logos, you could do anything, okay? And that's just one way of coming up with uh, a repeat print, and that's using a stencil. So that's the first kind of print I want to talk about today. Stencils. Give it a go. Okay guys, second kind of print I want to talk to you about uh, is something called a college graph. Uh, or an experimental relief print, okay? And uh, what we're gonna be doing for this is something a bit different, more abstract. So not really thinking about doing a picture of something, but more exploring textures and surfaces and things like that. And what you're gonna need for this kind of uh, printing is loads of different textured papers or different kinds of papers. What you would do is put down a piece of card like this and then build up some layers uh, and things just using um, a glue stick, covering your uh, covering your bit of card with glue, like this. And you could use different kinds of glue. If you haven't got a glue stick, you can use PVA, you can use craft glue, you could use anything really. And then what you start to do is just build up really simply some different layers of things. I've got a bit of the inside of an envelope there. That's got those nice bubbles on, yeah? Uh, I've got a piece of netting. I think that came out of a bag of onions or something like that. I've uh, got some sandpaper. Anyway, and you start to put those down onto your block. That's what we call this bit of cardboard now. Just to create a pattern. You could, if you wanted, you could, if you wanted, um, think about trying to do something more like, uh, you know, a, a picture of something. Uh, most people know I quite like landscape, so you could, if you wanted, kind of think about maybe making um, a, a landscape of different textures. So, you know, use the bubble wrap for the sky and putting in a sun and then using kind of like, sometimes tearing is as good as, as anything. Uh, you know, tearing out the shapes of maybe doing a, a couple of trees here. Uh, use this bit of an old potato sack uh, to, do the, to do the trunks of the trees. You could do this if you want to, like that, you know, that kind of sort of thing. Oop, you know, this kind of thing, like this, yeah, and sticking them down. You could do that, um, but I think that sometimes it's nice not to have to worry about trying to make something look like something. So. Carrying on with what we've got here, you know, a different kind of tissue paper at the bottom. Um, this bit here with the string in it might be quite interesting. You know, we could, in we could incorporate that just by tearing it off and putting it on there. 
you know, you don't have to tear it off. You could use a knife if you wanted to, um, or you could use a pair of scissors, you know, if you wanted straight edges on your things, then that's absolutely fine. You could go with that. So maybe that one could go down there at the bottom like that. Now, it is much better if you let it dry, if you let the glue dry on it. And if you have got some PVA glue, you could even pour it all over the top uh, and then let that dry out. Um, because you'll find that then when you come to print it, uh, the things won't move around as much. Okay, but if, it, if, um, if you end up with something which looks a bit like this, and you can see I've already done one print from this, that's why it's got black ink all over it. Um, what you then need to do is put the ink or paint on it. And we talked about how it didn't really matter what you use, you can try different things. You know, if all you've got is some tubes of paint, that's fine. Uh, if you've got something that looks a bit like this, uh, that's fine too, uh, but if you haven't got those, you might just have something out of the garage or the shed, that's fine as well. Um, I've got some ink here which I'm going to use. Now, I've also got a roller, and that's going to make mine a bit easier because I can get a nice thin layer on. But if you haven't got a roller, that's okay. Just go back to using uh, something like a sponge, you know, and just dabbing that all over it. Okay, so, in fact, we could try the sponge technique here, couldn't we? I'll just get saucers are good for this as long as you clean them up afterwards so you don't get in any trouble and when you're using ink or paint you tend not to need that much of it because it's quite thick stuff all right so um, then using your sponge you might just start to get some of that ink and dab it on and this is what I'm saying that if, the, if you've let this dry if you've let this dry with glue on it you're going to be able to do this work much easier because um, uh, th this one I made yesterday now most of the stuff is stuck down properly and if you try and do it straight away it will just um, it will just lift off with the ink so if you can leave it to dry the glue that you've stuck all the paper and card and things down with that would be great all right so look using all of that and spreading it all over uh, ink is very thick so if you are using paint you probably won't have to um, you know push so hard with it but I'm having to really press this in a little bit okay like this let's see what that's like now obviously I'm doing mine all one color you could choose to do different colors to see what what comes out um, you know I like just black on white paper I think it looks good um, but like I say you could do something different once you've got yours this is called the block now once you've got your block with your ink on it what you need to do is get your paper and I'm just using printing paper here, the stuff that you, you know, you get those big packs of them. Let's put it on there, upside down obviously. And then just using our fingers, we're going to press as hard as we can to get the ink to transfer across. And again, if you've got a roller, great, you can roll across the back, that's brilliant. But not everyone's got a roller, have they? Um, what else you could use uh, is the back of a spoon, that does the job really well. And you can press that all over and then hopefully you're going to get uh, an image come out now like I say we're looking at texture here and different kind of marks we're not really worried about making a picture Oh, the bubble wrap comes out nice if bits of yours start to stick to it just pull them off as you take it off and you're going to get a really interesting image which is something that you could certainly put in as part of your coursework if you're looking at any kind of textural work like that but also it's just fun to try really fun to try okay so what we're doing there is a collage graph and looking at different kinds of textures and marks and I quite like that just find stuff around your house and have a go okay so let's talk about one more type of printing that you could do quite possibly the easiest one of all of them um, and that is a, a good humble potato print um, so yep using a potato um, just cut them in half and what you've got to do is try and come up with some very simple shapes as you can see that there that's just sitting above uh, the surface of the potato you know maybe leaving about a centimeter or half centimeter and I'm going to use that to print um, some shapes now I've got two here I've decided to go with two shapes, a square and a cross, and I'm going to try and do something with those. 
Um, and sometimes that's quite a nice thing to do. But if all you want to do is one shape, that's fine. And you can do all of this just with a simple uh, knife out of your kitchen drawer. Again, I've got some real simple colors. Uh, and I'm going to just use the sponge technique for putting mine on because I think that that's the easiest way and it's something that you guys have probably got access to at home. And what I would really like to see you guys doing is maybe who can come up with the best pattern or design. Again, I'm not trying to do a picture of anything here. Now, rather than put the potato in, it's much better you can get a nice bit more even uh, paint on there if you use a sponge to put it on. And potato prints, as I'm sure some of you have... Oh, oh look, made a right muck up there. Start over. Potato prints, as I'm sure some of you have done before, are really effective. Okay, so we can just start to put in... And you get more than one out of it. You might get four out of it. And there's my square. Now I've left a cross there, haven't I? So I could try and put my cross in the middle. Re-put some of this on here. Um, and what I was thinking when I was designing this idea was, I actually was thinking about doing a, trying to do a tartan or, you know, like a kind of Scottish pattern. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. Oh, I slipped with that one. If you cut your potato about half an hour before you use it, you'll find it's easier to use because it's not as slippy, it's not as wet, it dries out a little bit. Okay, so... But even though this look might this might look quite simple, um, there's lots of projects that you could do with this. I know that recently um, with some of the year eights we did some weaving, uh, and we were looking at um, kente cloth weavers um, from Africa and how they would use different uh, colours and textures and things like that in their work. Okay, so once I've done that one, let's have a go with this orange one and see if this is going to work. So I've got a little cross shape cut in here. And I'm going to use uh, some of this orange for this and dab that on like that. Now, these are just paints out of my cupboard. I don't know how good they are or whether they're going to be any good for printmaking. But rather than go in the gap here, so rather than put the cross there, I'm actually going to try and put the cross in the middle of each one of these green. Uh, see, it's a bit crooked though. Uh, I'm actually going to try and put the cross in the middle of those green squares to create a different kind of pattern yeah quite like that let's have a look at it on its own see what it looks like yeah that's quite nice they've gone a bit skew whiff now haven't they yeah anyway coming up with your ideas let's try and put one in the middle if we can coming up with your ideas I'd like to see what you can get all right anyway so that's the potato print real easy simple give it a go Okay, so carrying our printmaking, the last thing I want to talk about, or the last kind of print I want to talk about, is something called direct printing, and it builds on the potato print, um, but it, it might involve you going around your, your house, your garden, your garage, your shed, whatever, and finding some stuff like this, all quite flat, with a flat surface, and what we're going to do is we're going to use those, uh, cover them with ink, and then print them down. Now. As I was going through my stuff in my shed, finding bits and pieces um, that I could use, I thought that this might build quite nicely onto the characters project that we've done. Um, and some of the lads uh, last term did some stuff on robots with me. And there's no reason why you couldn't come up with some robot designs. I think that would be quite nice um, using some of these things. So I think they lend themselves to that really well. And who doesn't love robots? They're awesome. So I'm going to just use black for this. Uh, and again, I'm going to use uh, just a piece of tissue paper. Uh, sorry, a piece of um, sponge for this. And get some onto each thing. Now, this becomes quite fiddly because we're applying ink to objects. Okay? Like this. And we're going to use those to direct print, which means that we're going to take them and stick them down and this time we are thinking about maybe creating an image or a picture okay so please whatever you use make sure it's all right for you to cover with ink yeah i don't want anyone <laughs> i don't want anyone getting upset with the things that you might be using here okay so again obviously uh, i'm going to think about trying to do a little robot here because we were talking about that so i'm using this small piece of plastic 
it's actually a bit of an electric guitar now these things I actually can wash so I wasn't too worried about that so yeah you can get some beautiful shapes going on with this uh, these are washers um, and they're a bit fiddly because uh, when you put them down it's quite hard to pick them up again sometimes so if that's the case uh, what I actually found works really well is to have a pair of pliers so that if I can't pick them up I can, I can use the pliers All right, so I might put that one there print it on now I want both of mine to look the same so I'm going to use these pliers just to lift it up and then move it across and do that if you use your fingers it will still come out okay don't worry about it okay so we use that I've uh, got another bit of electric guitar actually it's a back plate for those of you who've got one you might recognize that but I thought that that make, might make quite a good body shape so I'm gonna lay that on there and I am making this up as I go I haven't got a clue really what what it's gonna look like in the end uh, let's try and lift that up there you go that's quite cool uh, you do get messy when you're doing printing that's part of the beauty of it in my opinion but it's always a good idea to have uh, a cloth or something just handy all right maybe a bowl of water or something like that okay I don't even know what this is uh, it's just something I found but I quite like it's got a flat air, it's got a flat shape so let's see if we can get a bit of a print off of that so we'll cover that in ink maybe we could use this for one of the arms I don't know like this like I say I actually don't know what that is it was designed for something to be bolted in it or something like that oh yeah that's not too bad didn't come out too well at the top but maybe we put something else up there so there we go let's put him on there I know Mr Murphy loves robots let's see if anyone can come up with a good robot design for Mr Murphy we all know he likes those uh, I've got a little nut here let's just cover that and see if we can put, and make some shoulders out of that I think put them around that bit print them on yeah that looks good like that okay now let's think about what we could do for a head I have got this this could work um, this is a, out of a sink I think but um, rather than do that bit with all the dots in it I think I'm actually going to just get that circle from it there take that circle you there's loads of different things you could use for this um, things like this make great um, shapes to print from um, just have a little look round. but like I say make sure whatever you use you've asked if it's okay there we go here's my robot he's coming on well there we go it's starting to look good now I found this thing which I quite like it's got some interesting shapes on it it's got a little face one there maybe we could use that for the eyes and those bits there could be kind of I don't know let's see what they go it's got a little handle that one that works really well let's get that in there see if we can print that and turn it up a bit maybe as we go well that's not come out that great but let's see if we can use one of these other things to do maybe some sort of eyes I don't know I've got quite a few different sized washers here maybe it doesn't have to have any eyes I know what we could do we could use that I think that that might make a mouth shape if I'm lucky yeah there we go and I think we'll give him some antenna well, let's get a bit more ink on that but as you can see it's not hard to come up with some ideas that you could use um, to create quite an interesting character this has got a, a flat side so I might just try and put those on there see if that would work using the flat side give him some antenna there we go that's not too bad and then this has got quite a nice shape here on the end we might be able to get an eye out of that like that let's see if we can do that line that up put one there yeah I like that there we go anyway there's my crazy robot uh, made out of a whole variety of little things that you could probably find lying around and that's direct printing have a go Boys, I was suddenly panicking because I thought they must be missing me so much not getting to see me on a daily basis at school and laugh at my hilarious dad jokes. But don't worry, we've come up with a solution. I've now got a slot on Mr. Rove's TV, which means you can watch me on YouTube and laugh at me to your heart's content. You're welcome. So what's been happening in my life since quarantine, I hear you ask? Uh, I've been growing a beard. 
You thought I was meant to row for a second, didn't you? <laughs> I know. I gave myself a quarantine haircut. Word of advice. Don't give yourself a quarantine haircut. My family say I've put on a little bit of weight recently, but in my defense, I've had a lot on my plate. In this video today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about a home workout you can do, which will be mainly body weight exercises, but with a little bit of weights, which you can make yourself at home. And I'll show you that in a second. Before we move on, we should probably talk about the other workout video by Mr. Stenin. That is a sentence I never thought I would say. A workout by Mr. Stenin. <laughs> wow. Hats off to him. In this video, I'm afraid there will be no superhero costumes. But then again, why do you need a superhero costume when you look like a superhero? Let's go. Okay, before you work out, you've got to make sure you've done two very important things. You have eaten at least half an hour or an hour before, like a bowl of cereal or a banana, something that's got some sugar in that will slow release whilst you're working out. Second thing is make sure you have hydrated yourself. Drink lots of water before you work out because you don't want to go and faint, especially if you're working outside, the weather's really hot at the moment. Make sure you've eaten and you're staying hydrated. I've already had 24 Weetabix today. Gains, the fact that they're mini Weetabix has got nothing to do with it. I've had 24 Weetabix. Eat, hydrate, let's go. I hope you're really appreciating these high five transitions because I mean, who's ever done those before? So original. What you're gonna need to do is head to the fridge. Now I want you to grab two, four pints of milk. Okay, hats on, t-shirt change. I've got Thor to support me and we are ready to work out. I'm gonna talk you through the exercises you can do for all your different muscle groups with the milk bottles and also body weight exercises. So we're gonna start with shoulders and that involves five different exercises. Do the military press, then we're gonna do the Arnold press, then we're gonna do the Cuban press, then we're gonna do lat raises, front raises, and that's shoulders done. So, grab your milk bottles. As you can hear, I've frozen mine because it makes them heavier. Eee. No, I'm joking. So obviously it's the same weight, but I find they leak less and they just feel a little bit more solid. To start with the military press, you're going to press the milk bottles above your head and you're gonna bring them together at the top. Bring them back down to parallel with your elbows, parallel with your shoulders, and then push them back up to the top. I'm now gonna show you the Arnold press, which is very similar to the military press, but a little bit more difficult because instead of stopping your elbows are parallel. You're gonna bring them down and round and try and touch your elbows together or the milk bottle bottoms together. You're gonna to bring them back up, push up into a military press, down, elbows together, milk bottles together, circle round, push up. Yeah. The next one is a Cuban press. I have no idea why it's called a Cuban press, but that's what it's called, so deal with it. You're gonna hang your milk bottles down by your waist and then you're gonna put a little bit of a bend in your arms and then you're gonna go into the fly position and then bring the milk bottles up, push above your head into the military press. Down, up, down, up. That's a technical term, that, down and up. Hope it makes sense. We're now gonna move on to lateral raises. So, instead of hanging your arms just straight down by your side, you're gonna pretend to be a chicken. So, bar, 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 bar. I'm gonna bring up your elbows parallel to your shoulders. Keeping your arms bent. Not straight arming it, not swinging it up. It's quite a controlled movement. Elbows, power your shoulders. If you find this really easy, just slow the movement down. And the soon you'll get that burn and that'll give you that bolder shoulder. Which gives you that triangle Dorito look. And let's be honest, everyone wants to look like a Dorito. The last shoulder exercise is gonna be the front raise. Keep your arms slightly bent and you're gonna quite simply lift them in front of you. Try and keep your core tight as you do it. Parallel with your shoulders, back down. I don't want to see you swinging, but you're leaning back. Keep nice and upright, chest out, raise them up and down. So that's your five shoulder exercises. To keep it simple, with every single exercise, you're gonna do four sets of 10 reps. And if you're feeling really strong, do five sets of 10 reps. But that's with all the exercises. And that's shoulders done. We're now gonna move on to a couple of back exercises, starting with the bent over milk bottle row. Keep your chest out so your back is straight. I don't want to see you arching like this. Pull your shoulder blades together, chest out, head up. Bend your legs slightly and then you're going to quite simply pull the milk bottles up your leg so they're touching, so you're wiping your leg and then you're going to squeeze at the top and I want to keep your elbows really locked in. None of this, locked in. Down to your knees, 
pull up and you get a nice squeeze in your middle of your back. Once again, four sets, 10 reps. We're gonna do one more back exercise, which is the bent over reverse fly. So similar position to the bent over row. You're gonna hang your bottles down in front of you, chest up again, and now we're going to pull your shoulder blades together, chest and shoulders towards the floor. Nice squeeze. If you find the movement easy, slow the movement down. Okay, now my favorite muscle group to train is my legs. <laughs> We're going to start with a squat. I think this is called a goblet squat, but we're gonna call it the milk bottle squat because, well, we're using milk bottles and because I said so. Bring the milk bottles together in front of your chest. Feet shoulder width apart, attach your chest, squat down. Try and keep your chest up, head up, squat down. Try and get your bum below your knees. I don't want to see you stop in there, that's not a squat. Nice and deep. Try and wipe the floor with your backside. Keeping your chest up. Next leg exercise is going to be a standing lunge. Milk bottles by your side. Walk forward, knee to the floor. Swap leg, walk forward, knee to the floor. Change leg, knee to the floor. Change leg, knee to the floor. You're going to do 10 on each leg. Next leg exercise, you're going to require something to put your foot on, like so. Milk bottles by your side. Try and get good balance. I have no idea what this exercise is called, so I'm going to call it Tyler's Torture. Bring your other leg forward, and you're going to touch your knee down to the floor. Bring it up. Knee down to the floor. And this will burn your quad. Knee down to the floor. Swap legs. Get a good balance, chest head up, knee down to the floor. Knee down to the floor. Once again, 10 on each side, and that is legs done. So we've done shoulders, done back, we've done legs. We're now gonna do chest, but this one's gonna be body weight exercise, and I'll show you what to do. Okay, for chest, we're gonna keep it really simple. We're gonna do press ups. There are four different ways to do press ups. You've got the easy way, you've got the normal way, you've got a slightly more difficult, which works to your upper chest, and then you've got a tricep dominant one. So the easy way, you keep your knees on the floor, hands a little bit wide on your shoulder, and then chest to floor. If you wanna make it a little bit more difficult, you're gonna bring your knees off the floor, keep your body straight, rock forward a little bit so you're on your tiptoes, Chest to floor. Next shoulder exercise I'm going to show you is a little bit more difficult and it works a little bit more of your upper chest, but you're going to need to put your feet on something. So a chair, a sofa, a bed. Rest your feet on the sofa so you're at more of an angle, so your feet are higher. Press up again. Okay, that's the third time I press up. Next press up is gonna be more of a tricep dominant one to build those guns. Same as a normal press up, but this time you're gonna bring your hands slightly, slightly closer in. So instead of sort of out here, you're gonna be more here. So your elbows are really tight up against your side. You're not swinging out like this, you're keeping them as close to your body as possible. So, after you've done chest, as you're on the floor anyway, you're gonna move on to abs and we're gonna be starting with a plank. You're gonna do four rounds, so four minutes, so a minute on, 30 seconds off. Bring your knees up and put yourself in the position of, I'm trying to think of the object. What does it look like? Oh yeah, a plank. Keep your body straight, core tight. You're gonna do a minute on. It'll be the longest minute of your life, especially after round three. Uh, I never train core and I should train core. I'm now going to start training core. Uh. So you've done a minute on, 30 seconds off. You're now going to do sit-ups. Rack your chest with your hands. Feel that you've worked out your chest. 
and then you're gonna just move your back down to the floor, giving your core tight. Up to your knees. Shoulders to the floor. Okay, again, four rounds, 10 reps. If you find it super duper easy, don't put your feet under a sofa or anything. Just keep them firmly locked on the floor because then you have to really drive them to the ground and it makes it more difficult. 10 reps, four rounds. That is abs, done. Okay guys, just in closing, if you took part, massive well done. I hope it was beneficial. Maybe try and do some of those exercises two, maybe three times a week. It's really important, as I said earlier, just to keep your body moving, get the blood circulating. It'll make you feel good physically and mentally. And once you've done the workout, make sure you have a shower, clean yourself up, put some deodorant on, put some fresh clothes on, then go and have some food. And in your meal, make sure you add some protein like eggs or meat or nuts, maybe peanut butter on toast, so your muscles can start using that to repair and build and help you get stronger. Stay strong and hopefully see you soon. Take care. Okay, boys, just want to run you through something I've been doing at home here. Um, some of you might recognize, from the art, recognize this from the art room uh, where we've hatched out uh, chicks before. So this is a little egg incubator, as you can see, and I've got um, some Bantam Sussex chicks in here. And you can see that they're, uh, let's see if I can get the eggs, there they are there, yeah. Um, and I'm using this to incubate them. So this is doing the job that the mummy hen would have done, um, sitting on them, keeping them warm. And hopefully, if things go well, um, in 21 days, we'll have some, uh, chicks come out okay and I'll use those at home obviously have those out with my other hens but I just wanted to show you here in this picture uh, the sort of thing that's going to happen inside the egg um, and you can see that it starts off quite a small little embryo you've got the yolk there and that's what it's in and you can see this air sac at the top that's what it uses uh, to breathe and as it gets bigger and bigger it goes from this one to this one uh, and then down to here and up to this one you can see the uh, chick full size here ready to hatch out yeah as it goes through these different stages obviously you can sometimes if you shine a really bright light here's a bright light that we're going to use you can actually candle the eggs that's where you go into a dark room and you shine the uh, light through them and sometimes you can see what's happening so I'm going to try and give that a go today so you guys can see uh, what's going on and I'll also try and keep you up to date with what's going on, okay? Um, so yeah, let's give it a go and see how it looks. One of the things we can actually do is take the lid off of here just very briefly, it won't actually hurt them or anything. Uh, Mum would do this if she was sitting on the eggs because uh, obviously she'd be getting up to go and eat and drink and stuff. So you can see that it's just a plastic box. Uh, these are not too uh, expensive to buy. They're running at about 50, 55 pounds now if it's something you want to do at home. Um, and inside this one is a little turning mechanism as you can see as this moves uh, backwards and forth it actually turns and rolls the eggs and that's really really important for good egg development um, really really important for good egg development um, these lines that we've drawn on here I'll just briefly explain they're showing the um, size of the air sac inside the eggs because that's sometimes a, uh, an indication of what's going on or how long the eggs have been in there and stuff like that so yeah you can move them about it's not a problem um, but yeah really important just to check that they're rolling well every now and then like this because uh, you don't want them to get stuck in one particular place um, so yeah and uh, just put them back on and I have to make sure that uh, the little metal pin there is going into that groove otherwise Otherwise, uh, it won't turn them as it should, and then really important that the lid's on properly, <laughs> like that. Okay, so yeah, we'll have a look inside them now, okay? Um, this is reading a bit low now because we've taken the lid off, but it'll soon come back up, and that's no problem for the, uh, for the eggs. Because obviously, like I say, the hen would be doing that anyway. So yeah, let's see if we can candle them and see anything inside. Okay, we're candling the eggs here, and I know it looks a little bit like a... Uh, uh, a very blurry mess but what we're going to try and do is show you what the eggs look like as we turn them around and we might be able to see things and see if we can see it moving so let's just turn it around a little bit if we can 
So as it comes round, you can see the air sac there now. So as you can see, this sort of semicircle of um, light at the end, that's brilliant if you just hold it there. That's the air sac at the end of the egg and that's what the chick inside the shell is using to breathe. I'm going to try and get in close because you can see some of the blood vessels there but I think if we turn it a tiny bit more we might be able to see a bit more. Let's see if I can lighten this up a bit. There we go. That's it. No, that's not so good. Let's keep twisting it round. There we go. That's a great bit there. We can see the blood vessels now on the inside and if hopefully we might even see it move a bit but it doesn't always want to be obliging. So you can see all the blood vessels on the inside of the egg and that's where the um, developing embryo is attached to the yolk, what it's feeding off of. And you can see a darker bit at the bottom, that's the, the main body of the chicken. Sometimes you can see, oh, I could, oh that was me, missed it then. That just did a big move then, didn't it? You can see it moving around a little bit. Right, so here you can see on the egg that there are veins, which means it's growing. And as we turn it around, you might be able to see a black bit there. That's the dark egg spot of the eye. We keep turning it, we might even see it move. Look, and there you can see it moving inside. That's incredible. And this is, you can do this with this um, very bright light, so you can see inside, you can see the blood burst. The eye is really good there. And that's the air sac at the end, just hold it there. There's the air sac, and obviously that's what it'll need to breathe at the end. Right lads, uh, welcome to my kitchen. Uh, it's Mr. Roderick here again. Uh, I'm gonna do a little uh, food tech lesson, believe it or not. I know Mr. Brown's normally your food tech teacher, but uh, some of you might know that I quite like a bit of cooking myself. And I'm going to lay down the gauntlet to Mr. Brown on this one. Uh, I'm going to show you about making some fresh pasta. Uh, and the challenge is out there now to Mr. Brown to see if he can show us some of his favourite store cupboard sauces to go with your fresh pasta, Jamie Oliver style. So uh, uh, that's you, Mr. Brown. Now, those of you guys who might have done this before probably be familiar with this recipe. And it's a great activity, uh, not only for just for the fun for do of doing it and keeping yourselves busy, but for the whole family to do together. Um, really simple recipe. Uh, and I'm going to show you two different types. I've got... Uh, the traditional Italian special extra fine flour, Tipo double zero flour there and then some eggs, uh, nice large eggs, the biggest ones you can get your hands on. Uh, I know they can be a bit difficult to come by at the moment. So I've got an alternative for you as well, which is just the old plain flour recipe. Okay, so I've got some plain flour there. And we're going to mix that up with water. And you can combine these, so you can do one or the other, or you can even do a combination. It will work, will work. Okay, you'll get a better quality product with your Italian pasta, pasta flour. But uh, if all you've got is plain flour, do you know what? Make the most of it. It's time to make do and make the best of what you can with what you've got. So here we are doing that uh, in my kitchen today, okay? And I'm going to start with the, uh, the simple plain flour one now. All I've done there is put two big handfuls of plain flour in. I'm aware some of you might, have, might not have access to scales and things like that. So I've done two big handfuls. Now my hands obviously are quite large. Uh, and I weighed it out as I did it. And it comes to about 200 grams of flour, of flour in there. So... About 200 grams if you've got scales, if you haven't, two big handfuls will do. And then all you're going to do is you're going to take your water and uh, my mug there. That Thank you very much for Dominic, I think that came from. So cheers for that, Dom. And uh, here we go. So I put a little bit of water in there. And all I'm going to do then, and you have to bear with me because I'm trying to do this one-handed, is I'm going to give that a stir. And what I want it to do is to come together and make a nice ball of dough. Okay. So I'm going to mix that with my fork to start off with. I'm going to bring the sides in. And if you haven't got a bowl, you can do this on the worktop. Just be careful you don't chuck the water all over the floor. Okay. I'm doing a smaller bowl, obviously, with this pasta mix I've got going on here. Lots of different ways you can get this done. Right, I'm just going to get my hands in there now. Bear with me. I'll be back in a second. Okay. And I'm back. So there we go. That's what we're looking for, look. A little ball of flour, and you can see that the bowl it's in is pretty clean. There's not much flour laying around on the bottom there. And all I've done is mixed it up into a bowl and just giving it a work on the worktop, just for a minute or so, just rubbing it around in my hands, kneading it like you would a bit of bread, just to try and make a nice smooth dough. Okay, and then that's going to go in the bowl. Now I'll put that away in a minute, but I'll put that to one side for a moment, and I'll bring you over to my 
Italian fine flour. Now this is the one I normally like to use. If you can get hold of it, it's great stuff. If you can't, like I say, the plain flour, that's just a cheap old plain flour there, will do the job absolutely fine, okay? So, here we are. We've got our Italian flour, I'm making a little well in the center. And uh, while I had the camera off there, I took the liberty of just cracking the eggs into the bowl, okay? And if you've got eggs, four eggs to 400 grams of flour, okay? So 100 grams of flour, one egg. And you can make that up as big as you like. You can just do 100 grams of flour and one egg if you want to. You can do 200 grams of flour and two eggs, 300 grams of flour and three eggs. Depends how many of you are there in your family. I reckon, well, 100 grams of that is more than enough for one person, probably enough for getting on for two. So I'm doing 400 here. I'll cook up what we need for tonight. And I might dry the rest or I might cook it and then just eat it cold tomorrow. Mixed up together with whatever sauce we put on it later on. So there we go. And again, I'm going to turn the camera off just a minute while I mix it up. But you get the idea. Just mixing it together, bringing it in with a fork. And you can see what's going to happen there. Similar to the other one. But I'll turn the camera off and bring it back on. Uh, okay, here's the uh, the finished dough. Look, so we've got... That's the dough made with the Italian flour and the eggs. There it is. Look. In fact, if I just get it out on the worktop, obviously it's twice the size because I've used twice the flour. I have the plain flour. But you can see the colour of the egg yolk in that yellow one there. Uh, compared to the plain flour, um, but they're going to do the same job. This one's obviously going to be a better product. It's got better better ingredients in it, but they're going to be make great pasta. Okay, uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to wrap them up and put them in the fridge and leave them for an hour just to rest to let the gluten in there work out. Um, they can do that different ways. I'm going to wrap them in cling film because that's what I've got. But you might decide you're going to put it in uh, a plastic food bag, or better still, you might go for one of those reusable tubs. You know, with the uh, the, the air sealed lids. What you don't want to do is let the air get into it because the surface will dry out and that'll make it a bit of a problem. So you want to try and make sure it's airtight wherever you put it in. And then we're going to bung it in the fridge for an hour and I'll come back a bit later on and show you how you can use that to make your dinner later on, okay? Right, back again. Uh, here we are with our pasta that we made earlier. Um, just taking this out of the fridge. This is the, the one we made with the plain flour and the water earlier on. It's the smaller pack. Now, I'm going to show you how you're going to use this. And the first thing, obviously, is to take some of it out. Now, what I'm actually going to do is cut this into four, okay? Which gives me four pieces that have got about 50 grams of flour in. What I'm going to do is keep the bits I'm not actually using wrapped up to keep them nice and nice. I don't want them getting dried out, okay? And then the one I've got here, I'm just going to roll into a ball. Now, if you are lucky enough to have access to one of these pasta machines, I know some of you will have used them at school, Mr. Brown. That's fantastic. They're brilliant. They do the job really, really well. But I'm going to show you how you can do it without one of those at home, okay? Now I'm lucky again, I've got one of these little flower shakers. If you've got it in a thing, you can just chuck it like Mr. Brown really showed you at school. I'm sure it works too. And again, if you've got a rolling pin, brilliant. You can use that nice and floured up there. Or failing that, the old cling film roll works really well as well. So you can just give that a flower. And you literally just use it like a rolling pin, okay? And you're gonna roll it out. Now I want it quite thin, this pasta. And I've deliberately taken a small piece to make it a bit quicker to show you on the video. But obviously you can do it as thick or as thin as you like. There's no right or wrong with this. It really is just a question of what you like and what works for you and your family. Okay, now you can do it this way when you roll it out really thin. Okay, like that. You can see I've got that really thin now. You can see how thin that is. What you can then do is fold it up a bit. Go like that. Cut it into nice thin strips. Okay. Now the only thing you can get wrong here is if it's not the same thickness, because when you cook it, some of it will cook quicker than others, okay? But you can see there, I've got a thick tagliatelle that would do really, really well. About three, four, maybe five minutes boiling, hot boiling, boiling water. Okay, salted boiling water, because we put no salt in the pasta. That'll come up lovely, okay? But what you can do when you've got little ones in your family, and I've done this with my kids as well before, really good fun, simple way of making pasta. You don't need any of this gubbins at all. What you can do, just take a little ball like that, and you roll it into a sausage. Okay, you roll it into a little sausage like that, and you can literally... There you go. Something like that. Now that will take a little bit longer to cook than the tagliatelle that we made there. But it will do the job, okay? And trust me, it's lovely, okay?
Now you can go with all sorts of shapes, you can get really creative with this. Like I say, the only thing is to try and make them all a similar thickness so they cook at a similar time. So I wouldn't cook this one at the same time as I'm cooking this because this is slightly thicker in places, okay? But all you're then going to do, bring that over, and I'll just do a little example now. I'm going to bring that over. I've got a pan of boiling water over here, it's just starting to come to the boil. I'm going to drop that in for maybe five minutes and that is done. And that's it. That's making pasta for you guys. Have fun. Thank you.